Hello everyone, I'm your host MX2 and today we'll be talking about the release log for HardOps987 underscore 21. For this one there was a small update done with Link Ops with a few additional links. Two stroke has been added which will convert an object to a grease pencil object. In addition to that, Array now has support for grease pencil objects. We also added a Q menu for grease pencil selections which I'll be showing as well. And the focal point of this release is the improvements that have been made with Cycle Node and Geometry Node taking it to the next level. In addition to having Conform Object Support for Mark Kingsnorth's latest product, let's go ahead and jump in and begin. So after first installing HardOps, you're able to click the HardOps button, which will let you know if you're up to date, as well as point you to the market of purchase in the event that you need to pick up the latest update. However, once you also have it installed, you can press Q and under settings is an option called Link Ops. In this update, there's been an advertisement added for the free sci-fi terminal mini course produced by Blender Bros. Clicking it will take you to their page where you can pick that up. However, if we press up, you also see that there is an ad in here for Blender Hard Surface Weapons course, which was produced by Nighthawk and Stellar, which is also worth checking out. You continue pressing up, we also see the 202 decals which are able to be picked up by clicking on the button. Also, there is a tutorial released about making a sci-fi remote using add-ons in Blender. That is also worth checking out and so forth. You can continue going through Link Ops to look at the various advertisements to find various ways to get around the Hops ecosystem as well as find additional products and things to get you inspired. But that's really it. We just updated it to add a link to the sci-fi terminal mini course in addition to Stellar's recent course, which I hope everyone checks out. So to set up a quick demonstration for two stroke, I have box cutter open and we have our box, which I'll just begin cutting. And with our cuts placed, we have auto parenting on, which means that if I move the object, the cutters will go along with it. But in order to demonstrate this example properly, we'll also need to duplicate this. If I were to shift D, we see that the cutters do not go along with the object. And for that reason, inside Q operations, we have an option called uniqueify, which if we shift click it, it will uniqueify in addition to put us in a translation mode where we can quickly move it over. The cutters are exposed for this, but if we just press one, we can go back to our general collection. And now we have two objects that are exactly the same that are still live with their modifiers intact. So Blender has the ability to convert an object into a grease pencil stroke. So if we click on object and we go to convert, we can convert this to grease pencil which gives us something that looks like this, which is pretty cool. You can also go in the F9 and adjust the thickness and your threshold angle and things like that. And one of the things that kind of gets me with it is how it treats faces whenever it comes to the conversion process. As we see, there's been these big blank faces being added over the ingon areas because it solved it kind of like how subdivision would solve it, which isn't entirely the best way. So let's control Z and undo that. And let's actually put a triangulate modifier on it. Triangulate is used for kind of getting the mesh to a same point for things like subdivision, but it can also help in this case. And we should see that this time we won't have that nasty face there. However, we do get another problem. So if we convert this to grease pencil, we now have all these excess lines happening everywhere, which is just tragic, but we don't have issues with white obscuring what's happening. And so for this reason, we sought to make our own convert to stroke kind of operator to maybe do this a little bit more efficiently for our needs. So if we press Q, we can go under Mesh Tools and click on Two Stroke, and we see that this object's being converted to stroke. There's no issue with triangulation happening that's causing it to give us excess lines on the surface, nor are we dealing with those ugly white faces. So the purpose of this is sometimes you want to just model something quick while you're sketching and then position it into place in order to use it in your sketch, but have it be a 3D model that's converted to a grease pencil stroke, or at least that's what I think it was for. If we change our view over to viewport and we make the viewport white and we turn off all viewport visualizations, you know, it kind of looks like a sketch like that. So one of the weird things you'll notice is that the line sometimes will just get a little bit odd, but that is just a byproduct of this. Of course, this isn't to replace the very lovely um, convert to grease pencil or convert collection to grease pencil sketch modifier. This is more just to help with just simple sketches in which you just need to create an object that you need to use inside of a sketch. So let's press X and delete this and shift A add a cylinder. And a cylinder is another case that we also fought with over the course of getting this right. 
because it's real easy for a cylinder in conversion to a grease pencil sketch to just not work out right. So let's uniquify this again, just so we have a secondary one to test with and we don't have to reuse the same object. So with our main object selected here, I'm gonna to go to Object, Convert, Grease Pencil, and we see that you know basically every edge was converted to grease pencil, which I guess this could work. You know, I'm just thinking in terms of a sketch, like if you were having to stick out of a robot sketch, how this would come across compared to what we were actually going for. So instead of showing every single edge and every single face, if we were to press Q, go under mesh tools and use two stroke, we see this just a simple cylinder. And the best part is if we were to just um, apply visual geometry to mesh, and we just grab this side edge and we marked it and we mirrored it to the other side using Mesh Machine. Then whenever we go through the process of converting it to a stroke, we see that those marked lines also get marked as a stroke. So that's just part of what we're going for with it. You know, not to replace what Blender already has going for it, but just to make something a little bit more useful to our needs. So I hope users get in and try it and find some use out of it. So previously we talked about the conversion object of objects into grease pencil strokes. If we just delete this example that didn't work out for us and we leave ourselves with just this, we can also press Q, which shows that there's now a Q menu for grease pencil objects in object mode. And if we activate array, we can press V to activate 3D array. We can do all the things that you would normally be able to do inside of array to an object, but now to grease pencil objects. So here I've pressed A to add an additional array where now I'm actually adjusting the Z amount. However, I probably need to pull back in order to get my bearings right. But just like that, we are able to array grease pencil objects without any sort of difficulty. In fact, there's more than likely no reason for users to ever want to have to do these things, but it just seemed necessary that in lieu of our grease pencil work that we also should make as many of our tools support grease pencil as possible. As shown in the previous slide, there's now a Q menu for object mode whenever you have a grease pencil object selected. Here we'll just click to add a lattice, press Q, and just add some spans, maybe just one span. And then from here, just grab our points and just begin making modifications. And grease pencil is actually pretty versatile compared to a mesh, and it's just a lot of fun to get in and just get random with, especially whenever it comes to playing with lattices. I like to get in here and just see what I'm able to come up with just by experimenting with just sketches. So here I am in Blender 3.0, the latest version. Whenever it comes to geometry nodes, it's not even worth bothering with them in 2.93. They're a misnomer. The version 3.0 currently is the version that should be existing in the future. So with our cube selected, I'm just going to add a new graph. And we're just going to drag this over and just begin talking about some of the latest updates we've done with hard ops for the graph editor in this update. So right now we have no node selected. You can see that both of them are deselected. If we press Q and we click on cycle node, we see that we're actually able to scroll through basically every node. And an interesting thing about the nodes is that, you know, by scrolling, you can actually see how many nodes are total. There's a total of 131 nodes in Blender. And so basically scrolling through every single node in order to get the right one, it's just not going to work for us, even though we could scroll and meticulously find the exact node that we need. There are faster ways. So now whenever you press tab, you can expand and bring up the dot UI where you can basically go in and search for things. So let's say I typed in the word text we see that text doesn't bring up anything. Let's type in string. And now whenever I scroll, we see that we're actually able to search for string nodes. And so just clicking, I now have this node selected and I'm able to easily move it because it's the default selected node. Let's just put some default text in here, like Blender, and we'll connect it to the group input so that way it shows up on the modifier. And if we connect this to the output, we see all we did was create a curve that says the word Blender. So this is where cycle nodes and its latest updates can show up in earnest. So if we just shift click, we are able to begin scrolling through nodes until we find the right node that would hypothetically be connected to this. So I want resample curve, we want to set this to 250. We'll select the resample, shift click in order to jump into a pin mode. And the next one that we're looking for is for cyclic. So we're just rolling up, set spline cyclic. The next one we're looking for is for us to trim the curve. And so whenever it comes to actually having a game plan as far as what you're doing with nodes, we see that there's some power in the scrolling system for being able to additively scroll and add your nodes. So whenever it comes to what these nodes do, this one basically turns a text entry into a curve. This one will t take a curve 
point count and actually resample it and get this case turning into 250. And this one actually will make the curve open-ended. So if it's not open-ended, we aren't able to trim it. So by basically making it cyclic, we're able to basically trim the curve and make it go in just like we're seeing. However, let's continue. So I'm just going to cycle node and we see that if you don't shift click, you're basically going to scroll through looking for the right node. However, you're going to be doing it in this particular state. So it's still the same thing as we were talking about in the last update. In this case, we're looking for curve to mesh, which is right here. And we'll just expand this, go ahead and connect this. And so let's just deselect, press Q, cycle node, and we're back inside of all mode. And what we're looking for is a Bezier circle, which we can scroll our way to a Bezier circle if you want, but you can also just press tab and we can just roll up the dot UI until we get to not mesh primitives. We actually want to scroll up even more until we get to curve primitives. And then when we roll the wheel, we're able to begin scrolling through just the curve primitives, which we already came across curve circle, which is what we need. So let's just click and bring that out. And let's also connect our profile curve and set this to 0 0.01 so things just look better. And because this is just our taper object for our curve, basically, we don't need a resolution 32. That's a lot of extra geometry. But now we actually have a mesh that we can see inside of render mode. So let's just create a quick material. We'll change this principal shader over to an emission, give it a cool color, pink. I wonder if I could just drag a material into the node there. That would be cool but we can't do that at this time. But what we can do is cycle through our nodes until we are looking for basically the material assignment, which it looks like we already found it. I was going to actually bring up the search function and search for it explicitly, but it looks like a little bit of scrolling, you can get there. So now we have a material assigned to this, meaning that whenever we hit render, we're looking at it looking like this. So let's press Alt V V just to bring up our viewport adjustment and we'll press V to turn off the background and press Q to turn on Bloom. And from there, we now are looking at this the way that we want to show it. So now we have this curve that can say anything we want it to say, and we're able to adjust the end factor in order to adjust our curve. In fact, we could also play with the start as well. I never play with the start for some reason. You know, let's play with the start today. So the next thing from here is, you know, I use Shift A to bring up the Add menu. But because the add menu is so important, we also added it to the Q menu. So you basically, you can press Q, go to add, and then from there, you could even right click your favorite notes. Like for example, I always need a value node. So let's right click that, add that to quick favorites, and now we have a value node that we can bring in. So inside of this value node, I'm just gonna zoom in and type in pound COS, open parentheses, frame times zero point, let's go with one five today. Actually, let's go with 0, 025 today. And if we begin playing the animation, we can actually see what the value is going to. So it's going to go all the way up to positive 1 and then all the way down to negative 1, which is fine, but we don't want to put a negative value in this because there is no negative value for it to demonstrate. So this is a part where we want to map the value. So let's just shift click cycle node and roll our way to map range, which is precisely the node that we need. And we just want to go from negative one to positive one on our input and turn that to zero and one. So by just connecting it to our start, this is now what we have created just very fast getting in and playing with geometry nodes. So I consider this like the first node tree that everyone should probably try to build because it's really basic and kind of shows you a lot of what geometry nodes has to offer. And I'm always looking for that sort of example. Whenever it comes to giving it some hang time, by lowering the number, we can make it hang on the start and also hang on the end. So now it'll say Blender, and then it'll just sit there. And the best part is we can go to the modifier and we can just make this say Hard Ops, and it'll just dynamically update and we're able to just keep working. And I'm actually quite enamored with this process because this is something I previously used to have to use an add-on for, and now we see this just built into Blender, just easy as day, which is what we've always wanted to see. But with that, we'll wrap this and move to the next section. Mark recently released a tool called Conform Object, and the easiest way to demonstrate it is to just press Q and go to Mesh Tools, and we'll hit this with a sphere cast. And then from here, we can Shift A and just bring in a box and just place it up above and begin, you know, let's just do some maneuvers to it. So we'll get in here with Box Cutter, mirror it to the other side, perform a few additional cuts, and something like this, maybe even a cut on the inside. 
And to really make it conform to the bottom, I find that you know looking at it either in top view or bottom view and just going to dice in edit mode and pressing V also helps with it just because it'll help it conform very nicely to the bottom. And from here, we're just going to select this object and this object. And by going under mesh tools, if you have conform object installed, as in you purchase it from the market, whenever you press Q under mesh tools, there'll be an option for you to conform the object. And so basically with this thing, we can just go in and play with the end factor in order to preserve the area that we want while getting it to conform in the area that we want, which is really the beauty of this thing. I am a big fan of this tool because it's so simple and does one thing very well, which is conform the object. However, whenever it comes to duplicating it, we can just shift D, right click, and we don't have any more conforming to have to deal with. So let us just rotate this a couple of times, scale it up, and right click again. And we see that conform objects also in the right click menu where we can go in and begin making fine adjustments to what exactly is being conformed to the object. In fact, the conforming grid is also something interesting that I didn't even know about until I read his documentation. It's like, oh snap, dude, there's a grid that we can deal with. That's awesome. But let's undo this. And we see that our object is actually over encompassing by quite a bit. So we want to just have it fit inside the bounds. So let us press Q, go under mesh tools, conform object, conform object again. And this time we see that we have a more fluid transition happening with the surface. And because I actually clicked away, we no longer have the F9. So I imagine that that's something that new users struggle with is the awareness that whenever you use an operation, the F9 that's located here is only here for a brief moment. Like the moment that I deselect or I select another object, this entire option is gone and we can't revisit it ever again. But we can at least go in and look at that cool grid for a moment. In fact, let's play with our grid subdivisions just to see what it's doing, almost nothing, but still very interesting to look at. I still feel there's more documentation that I need to review on this, but just wanted to give a shout out to Mark Kingsnorth for his recent add-on. In fact, if you press Control K, you can bring up the preferences for both hard ops and box cutter. And under the add-ons tab, we see that conform object also has a button where basically clicking it will take you to the sales page where you can pick up the product. But in the event that you have it, or you have any of them, just clicking these buttons will just remind you that these tools are active. It appears that I need to update my batch ops, but other than that, everything else is pretty active. All systems are a go. So here we'll select this object, and if we press Control tilde, underneath the object area of the helper, there's now a tab for dimensions. So in the event that you're one of those people that needs to get in and adjust their dimensions of their object on the fly, using the helper, there is now an option for that. Hey everyone, Stellar here. I'm proud to present my new course, and joining us in this course is my buddy Josh. I'm Josh, and I go by Nighthawk Online. I'll be taking you through cleaning up the mid-poly that I'm getting from Stella into a low-poly game-ready mesh, and that's in Blender. We'll be looking at creating a high poly mesh to bake the details from onto the low poly and that'll be creating either ZBrush or Blender depending on your choice and then we'll be looking at baking these textures in either Marmoset or Substance Painter just depending on what your personal choice is. And once I get the low poly from Josh, we then take a deep dive into Substance Painter and texture the weapon in a few different styles. Once we're done with that we'll be wrapping it up with a basic render setup in Blender in the course, we will go in-depth and explain many different methods to complete the weapon. This course isn't for beginners, so keep that in mind as well. We will be using a few different add-ons, but the main ones are box cutter and hard ops. We hope you want to take the deep dive and the journey into creating a nice game-ready AR-15, and thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.